right. Thank you everyone for joining us and welcome. Um, I'm Melissa Ralstead. I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. And I am joined today by um, Martha Seelman, is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. From the Studio Art Quilt Associates, who will be our speaker today. And as I mentioned to you previously, I'm so excited to have you join us. Um, for those of you that are joining us, if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. Um, we will be monitoring the chat as the conversation goes. And for those of you joining us on Facebook, feel free to post your questions on Facebook. We do monitor that as well. So you, you are more than welcome to ask questions. We will be holding questions until the end. Feel free to post them in the chat and on Facebook as the conversation and as the presentation goes. We will get to them, I promise, at the end. Um, so I'll, I'll come back and ask Martha uh, all of your questions uh, at the end. And for those of you that are new to the museum, we are located in um, Wisconsin, just a little bit north of Milwaukee, about 30 minutes north of Milwaukee. We are open right now, so if you are in the area, I welcome you to come on and stop in um, with COVID protections, obviously, but uh, you are welcome to stop in. We do changing, rotating exhibits um, about four times a, a year. And um, normally, in a normal year, lots of classes and education programs and things, so obviously we're trying to move some things virtual. If you wanna see some of the programs that we've done in the past like this, um, I invite you to check out our YouTube channel. All of those programs are free. And since the pandemic started, we've also been doing virtual tours of our exhibition. So if you aren't in Wisconsin or in an area where you can safely drive to us um, or just don't wanna travel right now, you are more than welcome to check out our YouTube channel and you can actually see some of the virtual or the exhibits that we've done virtually. So, we also really appreciate Martha doing this. She has volunteered her time for this um, to help continue to raise funds for the museum. We are a nonprofit, and so your donations really do help. Um, we will be posting in the chat links for you to make donations. Your donations are tax deductible. The museum is a 501c3. So we really appreciate any, any amounts that you, you can donate. They help to ensure that we can continue doing and offering programs like this. So with that, I want to introduce Martha. Um, as I mentioned, Martha is the Executive Director of the Studio Art Quilt Associates, um, better known as SAQA to a lot of us, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing art quilting as a fine art medium. As SAQA's Executive Director, she has witnessed the explosive growth of art quilting, as well as growing interest in art quilts as a legitimate and collectible fine art medium. Over the past 16 years of her leadership, SACWA's membership has grown to more than 3,800 members in 39 countries. She is the editor of Exploring Art Quilts with SACWA, New Directions, co-author of Art Quilts Unfolding, 50 Years of Innovation, which we're gonna be hearing about, um, as well as the author of Masters, Art Quilts, Volumes 1 and 2, Art Quilt Portfolio, The Natural World, Art Quilt Portfolio, People and Portraits, Art Quilts, International Abstracts, and Geometrics. She earned a bachelor's degree from Swarthmore College and a master's degree in museum education at Bank Street School of Education and lives in Amston, Connecticut. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to you and thank you again so much for joining us today. Can't wait to hear from you. Uh, well, I'm happy to be here. I really love art quilts um, and I love sharing what I know with other people who are passionate about quilts and fiber art. Um, as Melissa said, I'm the Executive Director of Studio Art Quilt Associates. We are a membership organization um, with members all over the world. And I wanted to just uh, share with you a little bit about the organization. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, we have a website, obviously, sakwa.com. Um, what I think you may enjoy exploring after this presentation is in on the website under art. We have about 4,000 art quilts. Um, you can look at Sakwa exhibitions in any given year, about 12 to 15 exhibitions of art quilts are traveling around the world. 
And what I wanted to show you today is something that I've personally been working on a lot, and that's our online galleries. One of the things that we've been adding recently are highlights from different museums. Here you can see this is the National Quilt Museum. And if you go to collection highlights, you can also see highlights from the International Quilt Museum and also the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles and highlights from an ongoing biennial exhibition Quilt National. Each of the quilts, um, if you click through, you can see in all of its beauty, you can then click through to see more details. And then underneath, you can see who the artist is, the size of the piece, and the gallery, when it was made in the gallery. So I hope that after this presentation, you will go to sakwa.com and explore all of the wonderful artwork that we are gathering together for your enjoyment. Um, one of the things that I do, as Melissa was saying, is I write books about art quilts. And um, a, about five years ago now, Sakwa was talking with the leaders of the Modern Quilt Guild about doing a retrospective exhibition at QuiltCon. And what we realized was that there had not been a history of the art quilt written in about 15, 20 years. And so it was time for a new one. And what we did was we put together Art Quilts Unfolding, this is available through sakwa.com um, in the store, or you can get it on Amazon. And because my expertise is in contemporary art quilters, I um, recruited a couple of experts in historic art quilts, uh, Sandra Sider and Nancy Bavor. And we were joined by the then president of Sakwa, Lisa Ellis, to provide us with technical support because trying to do a collaborative book when we live on both sides of the country um, was quite an effort to um, you know, come together to choose about 400 art quilts from among the thousands that were available and to come up with a structure for the book. What I'm going to be doing today is um, a presentation about um, a quick history of the art quilt movement. I'm going to just start this. There we go. So um, it's called Layered and Stitched, the Art Quilt Movement. This is the book, Art Quilts Unfolding, 50 Years of Innovation. And in thinking about how to personalize the passage of time, what I decided to do was because we were tagging the beginning of the art quilt movement in the late 50s, early 60s, and I was born in 1960, that showing you pictures of my family over time was a way to give, to make the passage of time more concrete. So I was born in 1960. In Coming to in, in planning this book, one of the things we needed to decide was, well, when did the art quilt movement start? And in, we had a lot of discussion about that. And what we decided was that we really felt that the art quilt movement, what we wanted to define as when artists started making quilts that were intended as art. So there certainly are plenty of examples from in the 1800s, the 1900s, um, that where they are bed quilts that are absolutely works of art. But the art quilt movement was a purposeful use of the quilting techniques to create art that was purely designed to be decorative rather than functional. And so we decided that therefore we, the really we felt the start of the art quilt movement was in the work of Jean Ray Laurie, of which this is an example from 1959. 
And if you were alive in the 1950, late 1950s, early 1960s, um, these are colors that for me are very evocative of that period. I think my mother had drapes that were similar to the background fabric that Jean is using in this piece. And a lot of those earth tones, the browns especially, were very popular. And this piece is a small piece, maybe a sample. Jean um, made her first work as part of a degree in art, um, but then continued to make work and to popularize the idea that you could make art using quilt techniques. Um, with a series of articles that she wrote for, I believe, Women's Day magazine. And so she really was um, what we consider the, one of the founders of the art quilt movement. Here's another quilt from the 1960s. This is a Californian artist, Therese May. And um, you can see that she's using um, a photo of her baby daughter, Bridget, as um, a, a repeating design with different fabric, fabrics. And in some ways, for me at least, this recalls um, the work that Andy Warhol was doing in and around that same period with repeating imagery. Um, the art quilt movement was also occurring in other countries. So Leslie Gabrielsa is um, from the Netherlands. And at the same period, 1960s, he started creating these very large, um, if you look at the size, it's 70 inches by 96 inches uh, portraits where he was collecting fabrics, uh, mostly from um, thrift stores, flea markets, and making these wonderful portraits, each of which is hand outlined with a blanket stitch. Um, one of the things that I want you to pay attention to as we go through this history is that for the most part, and there are of course exceptions, the early quilts were an artistic variation of a bed-sized quilt. So they tend to be very large. Also that hand work was the primary, primary way that quilts and quilted art were being created and machine work evolved later and we'll take a look at that. Um, also that for the most part people were not creating their own fabric designs or dyeing their own fabrics, that they were using what they could find available commercially. And so all of those things, large size, hand work, and commercial fabrics are all part of what I want you to notice about this piece. So now we go to the next decade because it's very difficult to find uh, good images of work that was created in the 1960s. Um, most of that work it no longer exists or it exists only as slides. And what we found when we were putting the book together is that the color on slides has yellowed. And you can actually see this in this photo. I'm now 11 years old and that's my brother and my two sisters. And look how yellow it is. And, and that seems to be, unfortunately, um, a common problem with photos and slides from that are that, uh, that are that old, is that there's a major color shift. And so it, we were not able to find very many examples. But in the 1970s, um, and I'm sorry, this is a, a very blurry uh, image, one of the things that happened was that in 1971, the Whitney Museum of Art showed an um, exhibition of mostly Amish quilts, but it was the first time that a museum had taken a quilt off of the horizontal bed and displayed it vertically as art on a museum wall. This exhibit um, got a lot of press it also traveled uh, both within the United States, but also in Europe and in Japan. And it inspired a new generation of artists who had been trained as fine artists, but suddenly realized that 
fabric was a way in which they could express themselves. One of those artists was Molly Upton, uh, who lived in Massachusetts. And this is Watchtower. Again, look how large it is, 90 inches by 100 inches. I believe, but don't quote me on this, that this has now been acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. This is a piece by Joan Schultz, another Californian. Again, look at the size. Um, all of this or stitching is hand quilted. Um, for me, the colors in the upper left, that gold color, for me is again, very evocative of the 70s. Um, that was a really popular color. And I want you, I'm hoping you can see that the quilting pattern is um, a very simple diagonal line fill. Um, and that also is very typical of what was being recommended as a way to do the quilting on your quilts and your art quilts. Um, in the red and white area on the lower left, um, you have stitch in the ditch, which was the other thing. And then, uh, and then fills were very simple diagonal lines or clamshells. And they were, they were, of course, a design element, but the idea was mostly structural, holding the, the different layers together. This is um, from by Nancy Erickson, who's in Montana. And um, I put this one in to show you that not everything was geometric. Some of the things were more narrative. Uh, Nancy's work includes a lot of uh, imagery of animals and also um, a lot of concerns about the environment and how that affects the animals with whom we share the planet. Again, look at the size, 108 by 84, they're huge. The other thing that happened at, right at the very end of the 1970s was the very first quilt na national exhibition held at a converted dairy barn in Athens, Ohio. And this um, was really the first major exhibition that focused just on art quilts and it had a huge impact on um, bringing the community to, of art quilters together and also saying what you are doing is worth celebrating and we're going to do that. Here's another piece from the 1970s. Again, you've got that golden color in the background. Um, to me, this image, which is about the Cherokee Trail of Tears, um, has a very 70s feel to it. Um, again, look, you've got that diamond uh, stitch work, quilting work in the background as a filler, um, but it works really well with this imagery. Here's another European, um, again, to say this was not just American, this was also in Europe, uh, but Charlotte Ede, who's from uh, Denmark, learned about quilting when she was here in the United States for a year or two, um, as, as I think it as possibly as, as an exchange student. Um, but then she took the ideas back with her to Denmark and started teaching in Europe. Um, you cannot close the 1970s without touching on some of the real leaders of the art quilt movement. This is an earlier piece by Nancy Crow, who perhaps more than anybody else has been influential in teaching artists how to create art quilts. This is an early style, which um, is wonderfully geometric, very symmetrical, very carefully pieced, and with just glorious color, which is what Nancy is mostly known for. The other great leader, Michael James, um, who at this time was living in Massachusetts, now is in Nebraska. This is his earlier style of these wonderful curving diagonal lines. This particular piece I really love because he was playing with 
how different fabrics have different sheens um, and catch the light differently. Um, and I, I like the fact that this is not perfectly rectangular because it has those lovely rounded corners, which works so well with the design. All right, now we're going to the next decade, 1980s. This is me getting married. And um, in the 1980s, um, you still have those founders being active, but what they are creating has changed. So this is Jean Ray Laurie again, who we looked at at the very beginning. But here we are, boxed illusion. It's one of those um, things that sort of fools your eye. It's an optical illusion that creates a sense of depth, even though, of course, the quilt is two-dimensional. And if you look here, look at the change. So that first piece was from 1959. This one is from 1981, I think. Um, and there's a, this huge shift in style um, and, and in color palette and also um, just in what she's interested in creating. In 1980, you start to see work by Sakwa's founder, Yvonne Priscilla, who lived in California. She started out, well, she was a nurse, but she started out um, making wearable art, doing woven pieces, and then in the 1980s uh, began to explore you, the art quilt, creating a series of these immense robes. So this robe is 60 inches tall, which means that unless you were an NBA player, you probably couldn't wear it, but it is actually, I believe, wearable. However, her interest was in the interplay of color and shape. And she famously said that for her, red was a neutral color. Here's another person who loved red. Rosie Lee Tompkins, also in California, was exploring doing improvisational piecing. And her work really influenced a lot of the people who were in the art quilt movement. The idea that you didn't necessarily need to plan everything out on graph paper ahead of time, um, but that you could um, be improvisational in your art, just as musicians were being, in, oops, sorry, improvisational in creating things like jazz. Um, Tim Harding uh, lived near you guys. Uh, he lives in, in uh, Minnesota. And during the 1980s, he developed this technique of um, layering different colors of silk and then slicing through varying numbers of those layers and pulling them back in order to create his designs. He did wearable pieces as well as wall hangings. And I think this is one of my favorites and the book designers agreed with me because they put it on the cover of the book. Now here's Michael James again. Um, this is still his earlier striped curvilinear style. If you look at his work today, he is doing a lot, he mostly working with transferred imagery. Um, but this is um, in contrast with that earlier piece we saw. This piece is all cottons. He's um, using um, a lot of shifts in color uh, within the, the, the sections um, of stripes. And, but he's still um, not interested in creating something simply rectangular. And I love how his pieces break the form and extend beyond the edge. This is um, a piece by Linda McDonald, who lives in far Northern California. And for me, this is again, very 1980s that sort of, um, optical illusion kind of uh, design work. And um, she was one of many artists who were playing around with how to create the um, illusion of space in something that is two dimensional. Here's another one, Irene McWilliam is Irish. Um, and I, 
I keep staring at this because your brain insists that that chained area in the center must be three-dimensional. And of course, it's just the interplay of different uh, shades of the gray colors. Um, I put this one in because it's a wonderful example of how artists were starting to experiment with non-traditional materials. <clears throat> this piece is made by Ross Palmer Beecher from the state of Washington, and those are actual pieces of 7-Up cans, including the sashing work, um, which is the silver inside um, that she pierced with all of those hundreds of holes. Um, and the um, the pieces of the seven up cans are actually stitched uh, with a sewing machine to the backing. Um, here's another explorer of, you know, what else could we do with this art form? Sonia Lee Barrington, who was experimenting with just different shapes, as well as some different fabrics. The black that is in this piece um, has a lot of sheen to it. So I suspect it's some kind of polyester or rayon. Um, I wanted to include this one uh, by Ruth McDowell, who's from um, this part of the country, Massachusetts. Uh, Ruth is famous for insisting that no matter how much time it takes, she's going to completely piece all of her very naturalistic quilts. And this is a wonderful example uh, from the 1980s. And then I wanted to put this one in here. Carol Breyer Fowler Gentry is another name that of a founder because of her um, popularity as a teacher. She influenced hundreds of other artists. This piece is important. This is 1989. And this is the first time that a machine quilted piece won a major award at one of the national quilt shows. This was AQS. This caused a furor um, because there were still a lot of people who believed that a real quilt had to be hand quilted. And this piece, which is then acquired uh, by the National Quilt Museum, uh, was the first time that machine quilting became acceptable for major prizes. In 1989, that same year, Yvonne Porcella started Studio Art Quilt Associates as a way to bring together the artists who were working in art quilts um, so that they could uh, work together, collaborate together. And as we were talking about um, before this presentation formally started, um, when she started it, it was all run out of her kitchen in Modesto, California. Um, the newsletters like this one were done on a typewriter, mimeographed, and then collated and mailed out from her home. Now we're in the 1990s. This is my daughter, Katie. And these are my earliest quilts. Um, Melissa was asking me earlier, how did I get involved with quilting? And a lot of it was driven by having kids and wanting to make um, quilts. On the bed with the cat is my first bed size quilt. And as you can see, I started by doing um, <clears throat> very basic geometric pieced quilts with very basic quilting. Um, and the interest in art quilts really developed later. In the 1990s, though, in the art quilt world, um, there were a lot of innovative designs happening. So here's Carol Breyer Fowler Gentry again. We just saw her Corona, which was machine quilted and won a big award. This is a series that she did in the 90s. And I think she did 150 different ones exploring how taking a strip of cloth that you inset and then twist and that had different colors and then you twisted it back and forth and tacked it down, how that could create a really interesting image. And this was one of my first um, exposures to what could be done with the art quilt 
One of her pieces was exhibited here at a quilt show in Connecticut, and I was fascinated. I probably spent a good 15, 20 minutes walking from one side of the quilt to the other, because since the um, twisted tucks are different colors on the two sides, what you see changes depending on where you are relative to the quilt. And I then made my own twisted tucks piece, um, a couple of them actually, uh, but this, I, I love this piece. I, I just think it's an immensely fascinating work looking at how colors interact and how the viewer's interaction with the piece changes it. So here you can see the two <coughs> pieces. Um, and um, one of the things I find interesting about Carol is that she stayed pretty um, consistent with this full color palette uh, for, for most of all of the years of her career. Her recent work um, very, you know, deviates from this, but a lot of her work for many, many, many years used this complete spectrum in its palette. Um, here's another uh, very popular teacher who influenced hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other artists, Katie Pasquini Massapist. This is the uh, sh uh, colored shadows uh, design that she was working on in the 90s. Um, this is based on a photo she took of a river in, with winter ice on it. And then she translated that into fabric and then played with different colorways. Um, it's a beautiful piece. Here's another artist who has been experimenting with different materials. So Kyung Ai Cho, this particular piece was in Quilt National and won an award. And it is made of slices of wood it, with holes drilled around this, the perimeter of each one so that it can be sewn onto a backing. Um, She's also experimented with different dried leaves and dried grasses. And um, ex she wants to celebrate the beauty of nature, call attention to its fragility. And she finds that the quilt form is a way to do that by providing um, a structure where people then can really study the details because the structure uh, gives them a way to then hone in on how each slice of the wood is similar or different from the next one. 1996, Jean Sassaman. Um, this is a piece that she made for her daughter whose name was Willow. And um, I love the contrast of the black with the colors and the very uh, stylized organic forms that Jane uses. Um, she's continued to do a lot of exploration of plants from her garden, as well as insects and bats and spiders. And um, I love how the combination of the organic subject matter with this stylized uh, way of depicting it uh, creates these wonderful visual forms. Terry Hancock Mangit um, also was active during the 90s. This is um, what a lot of her work is humorous. Um, although it's all sort of social commentary. So this is her dashboard saints in memory of St. Christopher who lost his magnetism. Um, and so in the center of the bottom, you can see St. Christopher carrying the Christ child and he's all grayed out. And that's because um, the Catholic church decided that he wasn't a saint. And so they uh, removed him from the list of saints. 
Um, and this is how Terry uh, decided to memorialize that event. Here's another artist um, experimenting with alternative materials that still uh, reference the quilt structure. This is John Luffelholtz from Ohio. And this piece, and I have a detail here so you can see it a little bit better, is made of sugar packets that are sandwiched between two layers of screening um, as a way to hold them all together. And then he's got lots of little plastic flies being uh, attracted to the sweetness of sugar. And then because um, he's interested also in social commentary, the sweetness of money. This is a piece from the 90s by Ricky Timms. Um, and it is really, I think, one of the best examples of Ricky's work, um, looking at the variation in color and hand-dyed fabrics, by, by keeping within a very symmetrical and pleasing structure. Here's Nancy Erickson again. We saw her rabbit um, earlier. And she's still depicting an animal. She's still looking at the question of how do we share our planet with animals. And what she's done here, and this is part of a larger series, is take the idea of cave paintings and place those, that kind of imagery on the animals themselves. So here you can see her earlier work with the rabbit and then her work from the 90s. All right, next decade. These are my kids in 2004. They're now all in their 20s and 30s, but this is what they looked like when we got into the new millennium. Here's Nancy Crow again. What a difference. So we still have those incredible, beautiful, vibrant colors, but now instead of a very carefully planned symmetrical design, She's doing improvisational cutting and piecing in order to create her designs. So here you can see how things changed over time. This is a Canadian artist, Dorothy Caldwell. This is actually a triptych of pieces. Um, and <clears throat> they're large. They're each five feet long. Um, she's working a lot with um, wax and discharge to create her marks. And she's the, maybe the earliest proponent of the slow stitch, slow making movement. She said that for her, part of the, the point really isn't the finished piece. The point is the amount of time that it takes and how that amount of time is a reflection of the passage of time in our lives. And so for her making these marks by hand, doing the stitching by hand and having it take a long time is what her art is about. Here's another first, this is Hollis Chatelain's Precious Water from 2004. This won a major award, Best of Show, at the International Quilt Festival down in Houston. And as you can see from the newspaper clipping, the fact that this was a whole cloth quilt, Hollis paints her imagery with dye and then quilts it with hundreds and hundreds of yards of thread. Um, it caused a, a big controversy. People said it's beautiful, but we don't think it's really a quilt because it's a painted image that is simply quilted. And um, as you know, if you go to any quilt show now, this is a very typical thing. But in 2004, the fact that it won a major award was um, caused a, a fair amount of discussion and debate. This is a Russian artist, Isabella Bykova. 
Um, and I love this because it's just full of stories. Um, if you look on the right side, there's a strip of some of the fabrics that she uses in the quilt, and she does this very deliberately as a way of sort of breaking that, I don't know, third wall, fourth wall, however many walls we have, and, and saying, this is an artist's creation. These are the things I use to make the creation. It is not itself the thing. And, you know, similar or, I don't know, connected metaphorically with the, the um, where, where we now have um, actors on television who suddenly turn to the camera and start talking to us about what's happening and then step back into, ca into character. This is sort of the equivalent of that. Um, she's saying, yes, this is a depiction, but it's a manufactured or fabricated creation. But um, a couple of things that I particularly love, in the upper left uh, balcony, there are a couple of young people and there's a rat, a white rat, on top of the young man's head in the middle. And I asked the artist about that because I was really surprised that there was a rat going to the opera. And she said that in um, where she lived, that it was very popular to have pet rats and to take them with you wherever you happen to go. Um, in the center to the right of the wedding um, is, I think, the uh, probably either the, I think it's Beauty and the Beast. So that's the beast who's there and he has left a rose in front of the empty chair. Um, and then a couple to the right of him, we have a vampire uh, with his lady love. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. And we were lucky to be able to travel it with one of Sakwa's exhibitions. This is a piece from 2007 by Michael Cummings, who lives in New York. Um, this is part of his series about the, the um, passage of slaves from Africa to the United States. And um, part of what I find fascinating about Michael's work is that he is very interested in the mythology of the Yoruba culture. And so across the top, you have a mermaid fig figure that is from that mythology um, as part of his whole depiction of this um, historical, horrible historical event. 2008, Corrine Franzen, um, lived in Alaska at the time and was really interested in the mating dances of the cranes and a wildlife refuge. Um, and cre she created the uh, series, I, I don't know, 15, 20 pieces. Um, each one is dated as, as based on a photograph taken on a particular date. Um, and these are interesting because while the components are sewn, the layers are not attached except at the very top. Um, and so as you move past it, the air moves, which makes this top layer, which is very sheer, also move. So you have a sense in the art of the movement of the natural scene that it's depicting. And I guess the other thing I really love about it is that the body, the the feathers of the cranes are made from pieces of men's suiting that she got at thrift stores. And um, I just love the imagination that can look at some old suits and say, oh, crane feathers, of course. This is a Japanese artist, Shiaki Dosho. Um, and her entire body of work is exploring how to create the illusion of movement in fabric and thread, given that the piece itself is going to be still. Um, and this is a wonderful uh, piece that um, 
is is capturing that movement through the threads dangling down, but also the movement of color among the different pieces. This is a piece by Jenny Bowker. Uh, Jenny Bowker is Australian and her husband was the ambassador to Egypt. So they were based in Cairo for several years and she uh, did a series of portraits of people that she met in Cairo. Um, and this, she said that he is a doorkeeper at a mosque. Last decade. So now we're in the 20 teens and my kids started getting married. So um, this is the wedding of my middle son, Daniel, to Casey. Um, and what we start to see is a lot of interest in using art quilts to uh, comment on political, social, environmental issues. So this is Annie Helmert's Louder, and um, this is about um, the idea that we need to protect the environment because we share the planet with a lot of other species and that they have rights to uh, have safe places to live just as we do. This is a Californian artist, Lisa Kajak, who is really fascinated by decaying neon signs. And so she has an extensive series um, about these neon signs on old buildings. This is completely applique, raw edge applique. There is no paint, there is no photo transfer, and it isn't until you get right up close to it that your brain will accept that it is two-dimensional. And um, I just think that the artistry in, in, involved in creating these pieces is amazing. But going back to my uh, comment about uh, how things have changed over time, I want you to notice that this piece is only 38 inches square and that the quilting is done completely by machine. This particular piece, I think, is all commercial fabrics, but many of the other pieces that you're about to see are made with fabrics that the artists are uh, dyeing or stamping or printing themselves. This is a Japanese artist, Fumiko Nakayama, who um, got very interested in reverse applique and has now, um, is an influential teacher in Japan, introducing this technique to a new generation of artists. Kate Crossley is a UK artist who is really interested in using quilt, quilted forms to create sculptures. Um, and um, she loves collecting odds and ends and putting them together into these wonderful creations. The Pixel Ladies are a duo named Chris Sazaki and Deb Kashat. They live in Northern California. And they are an example of um, creating your own fabric. So here, what they do is look for uh, headlines from a variety of newspapers and magazines on whatever the topic is for their piece. Um, they transfer them onto the computer and then print that out onto fabric before quilting it on the machine. Um, I love this one because it's so evocative of, um, you know, your, your basic Happy Meal, um, but the language, the headlines, are all about the problem of obesity within this country. Um, Esther Borna Mitzvah is Hungarian. Um, and this is another trend that we're seeing more and more um, using quilted art 
to create installation pieces where you move within the pieces rather than simply looking at them up on the wall. If you look at the far wall under the window, there is a flat piece there, but the rest of it is um, these large works that are on some kind of a form and you would walk among them in order to really immerse yourselves in her art. Jenny Hearn is from South Africa um, and she works with, you. if you look carefully, tiny, tiny squares of different fabrics and then the central um, sort of river uh, area which looks sort of like a Y in the center, that's all um, tightly embroidered. Um, to create that and it actually is um, a three-dimensional, slightly three-dimensional. It's a, a recessed slightly within this piece. Carolyn Crump is from Texas. This is her piece um, about slavery. It also is somewhat three-dimensional um, in that the figure who is jumping off the ship into the water um, it actually comes out from the piece. Um, Carolyn is really interesting artist because she combines so many different techniques and you know, whatever best fits what she's trying to convey very powerful work. Paula Koverik um, is from Memphis. And this is an example of Another trend that I'm seeing a lot of, which is upcycling used textiles. So this was um, originally a round tablecloth that Paula rescued. Um, and then this imagery is completely made with black stitching. Um, and it is a uh, musing on the tension between the natural world and what in industry and society uh, bring to, to the environment. Susan Shai is from Ohio. This is her piece celebrating the election of Barack Obama and her technique is to write and paint directly. This is another whole cloth piece. Um, she uses an air pen and her image, her, the large imagery is obviously drawn, but then it's completely filled in with a sort of stream of consciousness diary of all of the events that were happening during the time, the couple months, that it takes Susan to make a piece. The other thing that we're seeing more and more of is three-dimensional sculpture made with art quilts techniques. Um, Susan Els is from Northern California, and this is part of her circus series. There's about 10 pieces in the series. They all move, so this carousel, uh, goes round and round, the horses go up and down, the proper calliope music plays, um, but each of her pieces is, has some little twist to it, and in this case the twist is that the people who are, or the creatures who are riding are animals, and what they are riding are people. Uh, Melissa said that you're going to be having an exhibition of work by Victoria Findlay Wolf um, coming up in 2021. Uh, Victoria is also a member of SAQWA and this is part of her series taking a traditional pattern, in this case the double wedding ring, and exploring how to break that pattern, how to play with that pattern as part of her musing upon the nature of um, American society. Here's another three-dimensional piece. Betty Busby is from New Mexico, and this is part of a series of vessels. 
her original training was in ceramics um, and then she became interested in doing art quilts and this recent series is looking at well how can she combine her love of the ceramic vessel form with art quilting and this is one of the pieces that resulted Noriko Endo is a Japanese artist and she's using a confetti technique um, of thousands of teeny tiny pieces of fabric that are then trapped under a layer of netting and quilted. And I just think that this is one of the most gorgeous quilts that I've ever seen. Here's another three-dimensional piece. Kristen Laflamme um, is an army wife um, although he just retired. And this is her commentary on how difficult it can be to have to pack up the family and move each time he got sent to a different base. Um, and I really love um, the sense of whimsy that is, that yet has this undercurrent of, um, just a little bit of sadness that you're constantly picking up and moving and leaving people that you've gotten to know. Judith Content is um, Northern California and um, she's using a shibori technique to create the fabrics um, which she then cuts up uh, pieces together and quilts very heavily. Um, in this case, those uh, panels, the long panels on either side of the center that are sort of a gray mauve kind of color, you can see the leaves that she put into the dyeing process to create those forms um, in this piece. Mary Powell is a Canadian currently living in Toronto. And um, she developed a really fascinating technique using cheesecloth to create portraits um, where the cheesecloth is heavier, you get a whiter, lighter color. And where it is less heavy, um, you get a much darker color. And she works from photographs to create them. This is, of course, Leonard Cohen. This is the last piece. Um, this is a piece that our board member, Shannon Conley, made for the annual Sakwa auction. And I like to end with this because it is an unusual technique in that it's lace in the center. She st is stitching over a, dis um, a medium that she's then dissolving in water so that um, you can see through this center section, but the message A is for art um, is really the point of this whole lecture. And then just finally to bring things up to date, here is my granddaughter celebrating her first birthday back in October when it was still safe for us to visit them. So that's the history of the art quilt movement. And now I'd love to answer any questions you have. Well, I actually have a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, and then again, anybody that has questions, please go ahead and feel free to post them in the chat so that we can ask Martha. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing, if you're on Facebook, feel free to type those questions into Facebook. Martha, you mentioned, um, that you're now starting to see more three-dimensional, um, that, that seems to be the trend that's, that's popular right now. Yeah. Where do you see things going? I mean, do you have any idea, you know, where it's gonna continue to go from, from that 3D? Um, I think that um, we are seeing a lot of artists want to explore how to go from two dimensions to three dimensions. So Sakwa recently did a call for entry and is traveling an exhibition called 3D Expression. And we weren't sure how many artists were doing that, but we got a tremendous response. And the juror had a really hard time picking um, the pieces that made it into the final exhibition. It's a gorgeous exhibition. If you go to sakwa.com, 
to art, to exhibitions, you can see the pieces that are in it. And some of them are just slightly three-dimensional and some of them are fully sculptural like the examples that I showed. And I think we're going to continue to see that. We're also seeing a lot of people preferring to put their art quilts on stretcher bars rather than just having them hang naturally um, from just a top support. Mm -hmm. And it, it, there's some logistical issues in terms of <laughs> shipping and storing pieces that are more rigid. Um, but Sakwa is dedicated to supporting and sharing whatever our artists are inspired to make. So, we'll, you know, we're figuring out those logistics. Um, and I think that the work that's being produced is just so wonderfully imaginative. It, it's great. How did you guys decide who, who to include? I mean, we've, we've had a couple of comments that, you know, asking about specific artists that you didn't mention. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine, I mean, there's such a breadth of work out there. So what were you specifically looking at to try to determine what? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, what, and, and one that um, we had a lot of spirited discussion about amongst the four authors. Um, what we ended up doing was looking for artists who we felt not only were creating wonderful work, but whose work really influenced the movement as a whole. So before we got started with a formal presentation, I was telling Melissa about the piece that you can see behind me on the wall, which was by an artist in the, working in the 60s and 70s. She's not included in the book because she worked by herself. She didn't know anybody else. She wasn't teaching anybody else. She wasn't exhibiting except locally, which is how I knew about her. But um, the artists that are in the book were all artists that we felt really made a difference to the movement as a whole. And it was hard. <laughs> we all had favorites we had to let go of. <laughs> and then we had a question actually more for us. When is Victoria's exhibit? It's, mm -hmm. uh, it'll be here at the museum September 2nd to December 5th of, of this year. Yeah, um, looking so forward to it. It was originally scheduled in 2020. It's one of those things that got bumped to 2021 because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. Um, another question, was there anything as, as you you were all working on this that you found surprising. Um, you know, something that it kind of either whether it's a trend or um, an, an artist or some of the, the materials that they were working with, but something that you found surprising or, you know, that you just weren't expecting. I think for me, one of the things that was a surprise was how early artists were experimenting with variations on the rectangular form and using other kinds of materials, not just cottons. Because when I started making quilts in the late 1980s, the, the advice was it had to be 100% cotton. You had to use 100% cotton thread. You know, th there was this canon of you must, and, um, and it, so it was really interesting to me to see that within the art quilt community, um, there was a lot more experimentation um, happen and innovation happening a lot earlier than I had thought it was. I thought that it was a more recent thing and it isn't. It was right from there from the very beginning. And then um, when you were, I mean, it sounds like as much as possible, you tried to reach out and actually talk to the artists themselves, at least mm -hmm. the ones that you could. Um, did that go back and then, you know, some of them telling you what some of their influences were? I, I mean, did that make you guys go back and kind of think about some of the other artists that you had had included or were planning to include? Or um, I'm kind of thinking about like process. I mean, were you yeah, um, going back? Yeah, and yes, um, in that I think we, I mean, when we started the building the book, um, we had enough material to do 10 books. And so it was partly in response to the information that we got 
that we were able to continue to winnow it down to a number that our publisher would consent to publish. Um, you know, I mean, this book weighs easily five pounds and it, can, it only includes about 400 artists. And of course, my presentation today, you know, you've got maybe, I don't know, 60. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is just a sampling. I, you know, I do recommend that if you're at all interested, you get a copy of the book, maybe convince your library to purchase a copy of the book. Um, because I think that you just get a much richer sense of all of the different artists in that are involved. Um, and then of course, go to the SACWA website because they're all on the SACWA website. Plus, as I said, we have almost 4,000 images at this point and we're adding more all the time. And so, um, and some of them are sorted by date. So if you do want to see that historical progression, if you go to those special collections, the online galleries, you can see how things change over time and mimic the color palettes um, shag carpeting and avocado green kitchens and stuff that, um, you know, we've thankfully left behind us. <laughs> uh, did have another question. Are there any simul similarities in the artist processes or worldviews that you saw? Um, I mean, I, I know. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, world view, I mean they're, they're kind of all over the place. Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I, I think one of the things that I've learned, and we were talking on this before we got before the presentation started, um, by interviewing artists um, for all of the different books that I've done, is that there definitely are different groups of approaches to creating art in quilts. Um, there are people who do carefully plan everything out ahead of time, and then just put, you know, basically have a design and then add the fabrics to that design. There are artists who work much more improvisationally. And um, when you talk to them, they'll tell you, the quilt tells me what it needs. And I'll say, oh yeah? <laughs> but they, they say, I just have this gut feeling that it's not quite right. And I'll add this, add this, change that. And then it will tell me that it's done now. And so they, they're they very definitely different approaches. Um, but if you talk to enough artists, you'll see that they tend to fall into one camp or the other. Um, Worldviews, I, I think they, they track what worldviews are in our world today. You know, um, different countries maybe have slightly different worldviews, but in the end we have more that's in common than we have that is different. And then a final question, um, and this might be like asking you to pick a favorite child. Is there <laughs> a favorite that you have? I mean, of all the ones that you saw um, throughout that, was there something that just, it, it's, it just was one of those pieces that grabbed you by the heart? Um, it is very much like picking a favorite <laughs> child, which I don't do, um, but um, you know, it depends, if you listen to me talk enough, I'll keep saying, this one is one of my favorites, and this one is one of my favorites, and this is one. And so I tried to winnow down the number of pieces that I was gonna share with you today, um, so that it wouldn't go on for too, too long, but I can't let any of them go. I love them all, and that's already a very tiny number of the total number that are in that book and the total number that I look at. In my job, I see thousands of art quilts every year and that's why I love my job. It's just the best. And I, I think we'll leave things there. Um, so thank you again so much for joining oh, us. We're getting, we're getting a lot of comments saying great presentation. I really enjoyed it. So they're not questions that are coming through, they're compliments to you. So. Well, I, I love it. I love talking about art quilts. Uh, contact me anytime. I'd be happy to talk to you. <laughs> well, thank you. Like I said, I really, really appreciate you doing this. And again, if you've enjoyed um, doing this, if you've enjoyed this program, I encourage you to make a donation. Martha has donated her time to us today um, to help raise funds for the museum. 
So we have posted the links several times in the chat, um, but easiest way to do it, it's wiquotemuseum.com backslash, um, or sorry, forward slash donate. Uh, but you can go to our website and check things out. I encourage you to go to the SACWA website as well, find out what they're up to. You guys have um, your, uh, the, um, I'm blanking, the, Textile talks. Yeah, um, the textile talks that, sorry, I just blanked on it for a second. Their textile talks, I encourage you to check those out as well. Um, and, you know, continue to stay tuned to what we have planned. We have some other fun ones that are coming up. We try to do them on the first Fridays. We did skip January 1st. I'm sorry, we weren't going to do something on New Year's Day. Um, <laughs> but uh, stay tuned if you want to find out more about what's going on at the museum. We do have a weekly newsletter. It goes out on Fridays called The Barn Blast. You can sign up right on our uh, website for that. And thank you again, Martha, for joining us. Thank you everybody for, for tuning in. And um, you know, if there's anything you missed or you wanna watch this again, we will be posting this to YouTube a little bit later today. All right, thank you, Melissa. Thank you. All right, bye.